and welcome everyone to today's webinar, PPE and Combustible Dust, the Often Overlooked Piece of Protection. My name is Ed Redkowski. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Synergist, the magazine of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'd like to thank all listeners for attending today's event, and especially Bulwark Protective Clothing for sponsoring this webinar. Our presenter today is Derek Sang, the Technical Training Manager at Bulwark Protective Apparel. Derek has been involved with the flame-resistant clothing industry for over 20 years. For the first 10 years of his career, Derek worked directly with end users, developing and implementing flame-resistant clothing programs specific to the customer's hazard. Over the past 11 years, Derek has worked closely with Fortune 1000 companies, educating them on the various fabrics, SR technologies, and the dynamics of arc flash and flash fire hazard as they look to develop FR clothing programs. In his current position as a technical training manager, Derek has developed over 40 hours of training curriculum for Bulwark University. These training efforts cover all aspects of FR clothing. Derek is a qualified safety sales professional, a certified environmental health and safety professional, a certified safety health and environmental technician, and recently became a qualified trainer for a low voltage based on NFPA 70E. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Derek. Well, thank you, Ed, for that very uh, nice introduction, and welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you happen to be uh, listening to our webinar today. Certainly appreciate you taking your valuable time to uh, join us. So with that being said, let's jump into PPE and combustible dust and take a look at, in the next, oh, 45 minutes or so, we're obviously just going to be able to touch on some of the highlights, but We'll look at what combustible dust is, why people are talking about combustible dust and, and what the concerns are. We'll look briefly at really some of the, the regulations and the standards and how they're relating. We'll talk a little bit about the new NFPA 652 standard and how it's addressing PPE and a couple of other NFPA standards that will help us at the end of the day kind of fill in this gap in our uh, hierarchy of controls to where we have, you know, eliminate the hazard, engineer the hazard out, look at our policies and procedures, and then really that last line of defense, if everything else goes wrong, is the PPE, and, and how does that relate to what we're going to be talking about with combustible dust? So what is combustible dust? Well, if you look at NFPA 654 and the definition there from 2013, it is, is defined as a finely divided combustible particulate solid that presents a flash fire or explosive hazard when it is suspended in air and it becomes diffuse. So how does that look into our, our fire triangle? Well, everybody kind of understands the basics of fire triangles. We got that, you know, in, in chemistry uh, early on. So you have fuel, you have oxygen, and you have an ignition source, and when they're all in the right mixture, we have a fire. Now, when we look at certain fuels, such as dust, gas, or vapors of ignitable liquid, those are dispersed or diffuse in open air. That's another side. So now you've got the fire triangle, and now you've got flash fire to where that ignition with that diffuse fuels, you have flash fire. The next piece is when you confine that, and by confinement I mean think of a manufacturing facility, think of, of, a, of a building to where that flash fire generates enough force to, to trigger additional fuel to be fed to the flash fire, so you end up having what's called a an explosion, and that explosion then perpetuates additional explosions, and you have what's called a chain reaction explosion, and that's where combustible dust gets to be really, really dangerous. So when we think about uh, our working environment, are there potential ignition sources available to fuel? Well, you think about it. In, in your facilities, do you have equipment that could potentially generate friction or heat? In fact, one of the slides I'll show you here was one of the most uh, destructive and also one of the most costly in human lives in both fatalities and injuries. It was caused by friction. It was caused by an overheated bearing. 
do you have people doing electrical work? Do you potentially have a chance for an electrical arc flash? Do you have open flames in anything that you do? Do you have welders on site? Think about the welder who is setting up his curtain. He's clearing his space of all potential hazards. He is working through his process to make sure when he begins to weld, there is nothing combustible or flammable within his area. All of a sudden, 40 yards away, one of your uh, forklifts bangs into an I-beam. That I-beam uh, then vibrates. Well, a Above that welder's head, 40 you know feet or yards away, there's dust on that I beam. Well, that dust then starts to def, you know to fall down, and if that dust is combustible and it hits that welder who is uh, performing his duty, he could potentially have a combustible dust uh, event occur in something that simple. So where do we find these combustible dusts? Well, they are actually very very common. And unless you're dealing with something that is uh, inherently not going to combust, like a salt or, or anything along those lines, a lot of the byproducts of what we do in food processing, and obviously anything to do with woodworking, we're generating uh, a fuel. Metal dusts, dusts like copper, iron, uh, anything along, aluminum dust uh, are highly, highly uh, uh, flammable and combustible. So when you look at food and wood, you're at 50% of common combustible dust. Add metal in there, you're at 70, and look at plastics, we're almost at, almost at 100% without looking at others. So there's a lot, a lot of combustible dusts out there. When OSHA sent out their uh, letter of high risk, it was over 300,000 businesses were high risk of combustible dust. There's over 300 combustible dust listed uh, on the poster in, in, in the OSHA website. So when should we be concerned? If we're taking a look at our facilities, what are they doing giving us some guidelines? Well, uh, layer and depth is obviously uh, an idea. If you're in your facility and you see, and, and it doesn't have to be a large area, if you see a small area and they say 1 32nd of an inch, well, what's 1 32nd of an inch? Uh, that's the thickness of a quarter or if you step in that area and you look back and you can see your footprint, you could potentially have a combustible dust hazard. The other way that's a little bit more specific is if you look at a number 40 standard sieve and you take the byproduct of your uh, processing and you shake it around in that sieve and anything falls out, it is small enough to potentially be a combustible dust hazard. So why are we, we concerned? Why are we talking about this? Well, the Chemical Safety Board, which is CSB, which does a great job for us in the industrial community, these are the guys that go out and investigate uh, all these uh, accidents, uh, accidents of significance. And it's not just combustible dust accidents. These guys go out and investigate all major industrial accidents. Well, they, did, they tallied up their number in 25 years from 1980 to 2005, they had 281 combustible dust accidents. That's almost four a year, and, excuse me, 10 a year. And then you have almost four fatalities a year, and then you can do the math on the 718 uh, injuries. Uh, they have been pushing OSHA now for well over a decade to get some kind of combustible dust regulation happening. What was one of the biggest ones that we had? Well, in 2000, and eight, uh, we had the Imperial Sugar uh, incident. And from this picture here, this is why these are so horrific from a, an event. They're not localized. They have chain reaction potential. You have one combustible dust explosion happening in a small sector of the facility. The problem is, is it then shakes loose more dust, which causes a chain reaction, and it will continue until all that fuel is gone. And you can see the devastation in this facility was from combustible sugar dust, uh, of all things. And that was later traced back in the investigation to a overheated bearing on a conveyor belt. So what, what is OSHA saying, and how is OSHA interacting here? Well, obviously, in for, foremost, we always had the general duty clause. And that's kind of where these combustible dust events have fallen when it comes to compliance and when it ultimately comes to citations, et cetera. 
There is a uh, relationship, obviously, between OSHA and our standards that we're well aware of. OSHA says you shall do this, you shall protect your people, uh, you shall protect them from being uh, hurt, maimed, killed, et cetera. You will do your hazard analysis of your facility and you will implement uh, the proper uh, protective uh, engineering, protective policies and procedures, and ultimately PPE. That's your responsibility. But how do you do that? That's the standards. And the standards can be the NFPA standards, the ANSI standards, the ASTM standards. We have lots of go-to uh, standards to help us ultimately comply with the shall that uh, OSHA wants us to. In combustible dust, we have a number of industry-specific NFPA standards, which is good. Uh, we unfortunately, up until recently, we didn't really kind of have an umbrella standard. Uh, majority, and I'm going to be very, very general here, the majority of our industry-specific standards look at really housekeeping. They look at mitigating. They look at how do you handle your dust as a byproduct of this process and how do you get it away from your facility, and then if there is dust, how do we clean it up? Uh, how do we sweep it up? Things like don't use air, compressed air to move your dust uh, off of machinery uh, and, and things like that. So NFPA 654 came in and was kind of viewed as, well, let's fill in the gaps. Uh, and again, 654 primarily was a uh, housekeeping standard, mitigating, preventing the ignition of dust. There was very little, in fact, there was no language when it came to the final step in your hierarchy of safety, your PPE, until later they actually brought in a TIA, uh, oh, my acronym knowledge here, uh, temporary addendum, uh, where they said, hey, well, we forgot to mention uh, PPE here. Uh, let's look at uh, having FR clothing. Uh, it was very general. If people are exposed, they should look to NFPA 2112 and NFPA 2113. This was kind of the, the precursor to what ended up being NFPA 652, and this was one of the first standards that in dust uh, that mentioned PPE, that mentioned FR clothing, and went out of its way to talk to other NFPA standards that could help employers protect their folks. So what is the impact of this new standard? Well, it was kind of twofold. One, we didn't have a, a good standard that talked about combustible dust and dust hazard analysis and what kind of needed to be done for uh, our end users, for uh, the people who are producing uh, products that create dust. It was kind of seen also to help from a OSHA standpoint to give them uh, an abatement. So if there is a combustible dust hazard, I'm doing a site inspection as an OSHA compliance officer. I'm going to say general duty clause, and then here finally is an NFPA standard I can put in the abatement to help that manufacturer reduce uh, his hazards and protect his people. So although there was no federal regulation, NFPA 652 kind of came in and, and filled a gap uh, better than 654 did. And here's kind of what the meat and potatoes of it. When it came to conflicts, remember I said there are so, quite a few industry-specific uh, NFPA standards for dust. So what 652 said is, hey, if your industry-specific standard is better than 652, follow your industry-specific standard. If your industry-specific standard doesn't cover this area, then follow 652. So almost as if you were able to take the industry-specific standard and NFPA 6052 and meld them together for your specific process, you would have a complete uh, standard to help you uh, protect your folks. So it, it addressed conflicts in Chapter 1. 
It also required the next big piece is prior to doing anything is you have to do a dust hazard analysis. You have to determine whether or not your dust is risky. Now, you may produce a byproduct that is dust, but the particular size may be too big and that even if it's dispersed in open air, it's not ignitable. Uh, so there are dusts that are byproducts that when you get them tested, you may find out there is no hazard. Then obviously there's processes that you're doing where you just you might be surprised that, oh my gosh, there's no way in the world that I thought my whey protein dust at my protein uh, you know, manufacturing facility is ignitable, and sure enough, it is. Believe it or not, whey protein is one of the combustible dusts listed on that OSHA poster. So it walks you through definitions. Uh, if you're not aware, that's not a huge big deal, but that's chapter three. Chapter five obviously lays out the responsibility. I think we're all aware by now whether we are from a OSHA general duty clause anything along those lines where the, the responsibility of uh, that hazard analysis uh, and hazard identification lies, and a dust hazard analysis is uh, no different. Chapter eight is probably gonna be the new piece for folks because now we're past engineering, now we're past policies and procedures, and now we're into that last line of defense, and that's our PPE. Chapter eight and 652 is where if your assessment determines that you could have a flash fire hazard, utilize NFPA 2113. So you're going to step out of 652 and you're going to step into NFPA 2113, which is the document on how to select, use, care, and maintain FR clothing for a flash fire hazard. Because combustible dust is what? First and foremost, it's a flash fire hazard. And chapter eight is gonna walk you through that. Then it's gonna tell you that NFPA 2112 is where you look to for the garments to be made to protect against the hazard. So you've identified a flash fire hazard. You've went through NFPA 2113, and NFPA 2113 is then gonna say, hey, in order to meet 2113, you're using 2112 garments. And we'll get a little bit more uh, into that as we go further along. So the most significant takeaways in my opinion here, uh, NFPA 652 obviously places the responsibility for dust hazard analysis on the owner operator. You do have three years from uh, September of 2015, there was a three-year window for you to conduct that DHA. So September 2018, you're gonna be expected to know whether or not your dust is potentially hazardous. It emphasizes training and awareness uh, for your folks. It steps up and actually has an FR clothing requirement, uh, which is specific and unique to this standard and then it takes you even further deeper into you have to have a written policy now for the care, cleaning, and maintenance of those FR garments because that clothing has now become PPE. And like all PPE, we inspect our PPE, uh, we retire it if it needs uh, retiring, we repair it if it needs repairing, and we follow the, the normal PPE guidelines when we look at 1910-132. So that's where we are, kind of where uh, we're looking as far as uh, combustible dust. There's lots more that's going to come. Will we ever get some regulation? Oh, the consensus is we, we were kind of heading that down that track. We had, a, we had an NEP out. Uh, it kind of died on the vine. Will that ever come back? Not really sure. Uh, with this standard, though, there is a lot more meat for that compliance officer now to reference, will we see uh, compliance officers being a little bit more aggressive when it com comes to combustible dust? Uh, we don't know. So let's talk about 2112 and 2113 if you're not aware of what those NFPA standards are. Uh, NFPA 2112, the scope of that standard is really 
uh, specifying the minimal performance requirement, all the test methods for FR clothing and fabrics to meet the flash fire hazard. So this is a manufacturer standard. This is for people like myself and other uh, FR clothing uh, manufacturers to follow. What it does mean is there are certain specific criteria that fabrics and ultimately garments and everything that goes into ma making those garments, they have to retain their flame resistant through multiple laundries. In fact, uh, for the flash fire hazard, NFPA 2112 has, has one of the highest laundry requirements, which is 100 industrial uh, launderings that these garments must uh, maintain uh, their FR properties through. Uh, the body burn percentage when these are done is uh, less than 50% for fabrics. Uh, it gives you uh, certain protocol to where those, far, those garments are designed, the fabrics meet certain specifications. There's other, uh, and that's a webinar within itself on NFPA 2112, but it gives you a go-to protocol for garments that are manufactured to this hazard. Now, what, as a safety person who's going through this and trying to understand it, what is sitting on your desk? Well, NFPA 652 that we just talked about, and then your playbook for the FR piece is NFPA 2113. This is your uh, guidance as far as how to conduct your hazard assessment for flash fire. Then once you determine you have a flash fire hazard, how do you select the FR garments? It walks you through what the minimum specifications you should look for in writing that FR spec. Then once you get the garments, how to properly train your people on the garments, what's considered uh, how to properly wear them in, in the field, and then ultimately how your people can care uh, and maintain this new PPE that they've got. So. Why not wear everyday street clothes uh, when you have flash fire hazards? Well, the problem is, is if there is a thermal event and your garments do not have FR properties, those garments could potentially ignite. And they're going to extend that short-term thermal duration much longer than it needed to be. Now all that thermal energy is on you. It is using all that fuel to transfer heat ultimately to you and cause you significant serious injuries. Clothing made from fabrics that self-extinguish, that is the definition of FR clothing. It ends the event. So by definition, flash fire, short-term thermal event. You're looking at something typically under three seconds in length, some of them far shorter than that. And if you don't have clothing ignition or if you're near the event and your clothes put themselves out once the event's over, you are no longer going to be hurt. These uh, fabrics are designed to limit, not eliminate uh, burn injury because obviously you're only protected uh, in the areas that you're wearing the garments. Uh, there's other areas that could be exposed. Uh, how long you have that, how you're wearing that garment. There's lots of things that could factor into you still being hurt. So these are not eliminating burn injury. They're designed to limit. That all being said, your survival, uh, your recovery time, the quality of life going on after a exposure to a thermal event directly correlates to the clothing that is worn into that event. So FR fabrics you have here, an FR uh, garment on the mannequin, I'd love to show you a video of this because it is far more impactful, but unfortunately there's a lot of buffers and a lot of firewalls out there that don't allow that, and they tend to be a little bit uh, tedious to watch if they're being buffered. So bottom line is brand new FR garment, three-second thermal exposure. The only thing that's come out of that garment is the navy dye. You can see some of the dye is still around it. The garment has put itself out. The, uh, the integrity of the garments, that is your protective shell in a thermal event. So when we teach people on understanding what your FR clothing is, you have to think about it this way. We deal in the secondary protective clothing environment. This is not primary, and here's the difference. Primary is knowingly going into a thermal event. Well, who does that? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Well, who knowingly walks into fire? Our firefighters. 
they roll up on a big red truck, flashing red lights, and they don all this PPE from their protective turnout gear, their specialized boots, their gloves, their hard hat, and then most importantly, their respiratory equipment. They grab a ax and they walk into a burning building. Well, how are they able to do that? Well, two reasons. One, they're firefighters, that's what they're trained to do. Secondly, their PPE is designed to withstand long-term thermal exposure and all the nasty things that's going on in that building, and it's going to protect them. And then they also have the ability to breathe in fire because of that respiratory equipment. In our world, what's the difference? Well, that firefighter, when he goes back to that station house, is he going to have all that PPE on? No. He gets to take it off because it's task-based. He only wears his PPE when he goes into a thermal event. In our industrial community, when we have these accidental thermal events, do we have time to go to the locker room, don our PPE, and then withstand the thermal event? Of course not. We cannot have task-based secondary FR clothing programs because if we could predict there's going to be a thermal event, we just wouldn't be there. So because they're accidental, we have to be wearing our protective apparel all the time. We have to be wearing our PPE, our shirts, pants, and coveralls. If we have that hazard, we have to be wearing it on a daily basis. The other thing we've got to remind folks on, you are not Superman. This is not a suit of armor. You are not impervious to injury. But it is your last line of defense if everything goes wrong. Again, looking at our hierarchy of controls, PPE, the last line of defense. If you think about it this way, uh, one of the easiest analogies we have is think about uh, the auto industry. In the last five years, I have seen more advances in safety engineering and automobiles than probably the previous 25. Uh, we have uh, sensors now that will break for us. Uh, we have side view mirrors that will detect if something's in our blind spot, not allow us to change lanes. Uh, we have not just front airbags, side airbags, top airbags, basically everything that can have an airbag is going to have an airbag in it to, to secure you. So why then do we still have laws that require that we click 70-year-old technology? With all that engineering, you have to believe it's obsolete. But I guarantee you, every state in the union and probably policies that you have in your own company for anybody driving company vehicles, they have to wear their safety belt. Why is that? because it's a proven life-saving piece of equipment when all that other engineering fails. Also, regardless of what you think of how bad it is on the inside, it's better than 250 feet down that asphalt. Ask any highway patrol officer the survivability of ejection accidents, it's virtually nil. So that's where your PPE fits into your hierarchy of safety. When everything else has failed, when your engineering, when your vacuum systems, when your duct, whatever the case may be, when all that has failed, the last line of defense in this situation to a flash fire hazard are the clothes on your back. So what do we look for when we're creating this FR clothing program? FR clothing today, like everything else, has changed dramatically. FR clothing from 20 years ago, think about your, your cell phone 20 years ago and what you have today in your cell phone. The engineering, the chemistry, the advancements we've made in, in FR is dramatic. That being said, they're usually a combination today of natural and synthetic blends to give you the benefits of all those fibers. There is no perfect fiber for any of our thermal hazards, so they all have pros and cons. Everybody is looking to maximize the pros, minimize the cons, and get you a, a garment that is going to protect you in this hazard. The key is look for proven products. Look for products that have a, a legacy, that have time in that hazard, that have been proven time and time again that if there is a thermal event that they have minimized injury and done what they said they're going to do. Training. Training is big because now you've just incorporated another piece of PPE into the system and like all our PPE, 
whether it's a simple training on how to wear a hard hat and your safety glasses and your hearing protection or something more sophisticated like your respiratory protection or fall protection, you need to train. 1910-132 says you have to train on PPE. Make sure that, that people understand how to properly don and doff it, how to properly adjust it, when it needs to be retired, when, how to maintain it, et cetera. So think about that it's appropriate to the hazard. One thing we don't want to do is we don't want to get carried away and overprotect. Uh, always, always the outermost layer. So if you do have hazards where people have to go into the elements and they need rain gear, rain gear is now the outermost layer. If it's temperature where you have hot and you have extreme cold, that uh, winter jacket, now the outermost layer. Uh, safety vests, etc. If you have uh, FR clothing, that outermost layer, that safety vest, now needs to be uh, FR and uh, tested to protect against that hazard. Always wear it correctly. The easy ones are zip it up, button it up, uh, tuck it in if it's shirts and pants. We have to train on undergarments. What are we allowed to wear underneath this PPE? This can be extremely tricky as people don't understand. They're thinking that that outermost layer is going to protect them. Well, if you're wearing something that is a meltable underneath uh, your uh, shirt or coverall, uh, think about high-performance athletic wear today. That's three and a half ounces of plastic that in a thermal event, when all that radiant heat passes through that garment, that garment is going to do its job. It will self-extinguish. It will protect you. But when all that heat hits that synthetic, guess what? It's going to shrink and melt uh, to what's ever underneath it and can cause, and we have seen it cause, extreme uh, injuries. Uh, make sure you're cleaning them. Uh, make sure that you're monitoring uh, secondary accelerants. If your manufacturing process puts people in contact with uh, oils, greases, etc. Make sure you're training your people on uh, watching out for each other and making sure that, hey, if I have secondary accelerants on me to the point I'm concerned, make sure I have the ability to change out and correct that. Uh, have a repairing process in place. Have a removal, a retirement process uh, in place. And when we talk about uh, retirement process, we're not talking about you having to monitor, at least in bulwarks, uh, case and the top manufacturers in the United States would agree that you're not monitoring the FR when it comes, you're monitoring the integrity of the garment. All garments, including your personal garments, have a shelf life. If you're wearing them uh, on a daily basis, if you have a shirt and pant and you have five sets for Monday through Friday and you're laundering them uh, on the weekend and you're wearing them again, they're going to have a shelf life. What that shelf life is, is independent of every wearer, but you have to have, hey, when, when those elbows are getting thread borne or those knees or we're starting to see, retire that garment. Uh, really a easy for the most part to maintain these. Uh, home laundering, we have hundreds of thousands of FR wearers that take their stuff home. Now, real simple when you take it home, uh, wash them by themselves. Uh, you can do simple things to, and these are more mostly cosmetic, but if you turn them inside out, you'll have better color retention over time. Uh, use liquid determin detergents. Don't use any bleaches or peroxides in the process and no fabric softeners. Uh, tumble dry and uh, you're good to go. Industrial laundries, depending on uh, how many people in your facility and what your uh, thought, they do a great job because now you're one point of pickup, one point of inspection. Uh, they're doing the repairs. They're doing the upgrades. Now, they're not, you're not indemnified uh, by having a third party. You're still ultimately responsible, even though you're using an industrial launder to, to inspect and make sure the cleaning is getting done. But it does have a lot of advantages uh, for your facility if you have a large head count, et cetera. Dry cleaning can be done for tough uh, stains. There's nothing. Uh, in FR that, that, that you can't do that way. So in wrapping up and, and hopefully having enough time to get uh, people's questions answered, uh, in the hierarchy of safety message precautions in any safe, safe, safety program, PPE is your last line of defense. But like any other defense, it's got to be implemented, ready to go, or it's going to be ineffective or, or null. Uh, 
what's that? That's your FR clothing is sitting in your locker uh, when you need it. All that investment's gone. You need to be wearing it. It's designed to self-extinguish, and that's all it's designed to do. There's nothing sexier than that than it just putting itself out. Uh, it doesn't guarantee that you won't be harmed, but it's going to minimize the harm that you could potentially have if your clothing did ignite. One of the things that we saw when you saw that last, you saw that horrific aluminum dust explosion uh, in China at that facility. When you saw those pictures, and you can go and Google those pictures, uh, you see those people who have been triaged in the parking lot and they're sitting on, literally they're sitting on pallets and if you look closely, all the skin is exposed because the clothes have been literally burned off their backs and there's numerous pictures uh, of, uh, of those people who are burned and literally you can see the remnants of their clothing uh, that was on there. Uh, FR clothing meets the requirements of NFPA 2112. That is telling you at a minimum an independent third party has verified that that manufacturer's clothing is going to uh, meet the minimum uh, exposures to a flash fire hazard. Can we always do better than that? Absolutely. But at least looking at 2112 certified garments, you have a good uh, starting off point in that specification. Uh, lastly, it's important that you partner with market proven suppliers in this. And what do I mean by that? As you're researching who ultimately is going to supply you, whether you go through your current distributor, whether you're going through your current uh, laundry provider and you're looking to add FR clothing to your PPE solutions, make sure that that's a proven supplier. And here's why I say that. Research who the manufacturer is a little bit. It's going to give you peace of mind because ultimately we build these garments to be utilized in the thermal events that they could potentially be exposed to with the hope you never have to use my garments for what I've built them for. If you ever have to use my garments what, for what they're built for, you're going to want to make sure that that chain of custody, that that manufacturing chain of custody is, is tight, that that manufacturer can tell you what roll of fabric that it came off of, what test results were on that fabric. Do they retain those uh, test results for uh, 10 plus years? Can they look at that garment and get down to the micron level and tell you if the FR technology was impaired, what did it impair, how hot did that fabric get, and was there any additional injury caused by uh, the PPE uh, in general. That is a type of uh, partnership that you're going to need when things go bad. And that's ultimately what you are looking for in your supply chain partners. Everybody has a perfectly good uh, navy blue FR coverall when it's just soil protection. When it never has to be used for what it's built for, everybody's is relatively fine. When you find out the difference between a $50 coverall and a $100 coverall, that difference ultimately is found out during that thermal event, and that's when you can't afford to have uh, those corners that were cut to get that economical garment uh, exposed. So that's do your homework. It takes a little bit of time, but it's definitely uh, worthwhile. So with that, I think we have some time, Ed, to uh, uh, answer any questions. If we, if we don't have uh, time to get everybody's questions, I'm sure the good folks here will send them to me, and I will make sure that everybody who asks a question uh, ultimately gets an answer. Okay, thanks, Derek. Uh, we do have about 20 minutes for questions, and a couple have come in. Um, while we're uh, waiting for a few more, Derek, did you want to uh, have us go ahead and put the poll up on the screen? Sure. Okay, great. So um, I think Re Regina is going to go ahead and put the poll up for everybody. Um, while you're doing that, um, uh, just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, um, please type it into the chat window on the right side of your screen and send to all panelists. Um, a couple of questions have already come in. Here's a question from Gordon. He asks, is there a maximum temperature rating for a flash fire for FR fabrics? 
Good question. Uh, the fuels that we typically, the diffuse fuels that we're protecting are in a flash fire event are generating temperatures anywhere between 1,500 and 2,000 degrees. Uh, the duration, like I said, by definition, has changed a little bit over time. Uh, today, it is a short-term thermal exposure. Uh, in the past, it's been defined as three seconds or less. Uh, so the easiest analogy that I can give people is think about uh, if you have a propane uh, barbecue, and I'm sure you've seen this, uh, you turn on the you turn on the gas. You click 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 click. Nothing happens, and you, you shake the the can a little bit. You click it the next time, and you have a big. Whoosh. That's your flash fire. That that short term thermal uh, event that just occurred on your tiny little barbecue. Think about that uh, with much more fuel in a manufacturing facility. That is what your clothing is protecting against. It can generate, like I said, temperatures between 1,500 and 2,000 degrees, depending on the fuel source, its short duration, and your FR clothing, depending on the technology, and there's a variety of different technologies out there, that's what they are designed to protect against. One of the tests that they go through is ASTM 1930. That is a three-second, 360-degree exposure, and, and in this one, they use propane, and propane represents the, the fuel. They ignite it, they surround the mannequin for three seconds, and that fabric has to put itself out. Uh, there, there's after flame uh, requirements that it needs to meet. Uh, there's thermal shrinkage requirements that it needs to meet, and then the copper calorimeters underneath that uh, fabric are registering how much heat got through, and that has to be less than 50 percent second, uh, second and third degree burns underneath that garment, excuse me, that fabric on that mannequin. Now, the difference between what's on the mannequin and what's in the real world is that mannequin is a size uh, 42 coverall. It has no pockets, no additional layers of FR. It's a, it's a single layer fabric. There's no other additives to it. So that is a fabric test. On the Gorman itself, you're going to have chest pockets, back pockets. You're going to have multiple layers of fabric. So the, the two numbers are going to be different. But at the end of the day, you want to have less than 50% body burn. That's the, the fabric then passes that test. The majority of commercial stuff you're going to see range between 9% and 35% is a good range of all the commercial stuff out there right now in that test method. Okay. Um, a question from a different Gordon. Uh, he writes, I've always referred to FR as fire retardant. I see you use the term flame resistant. Is flame resistant the same as fire retardant? Again, another good question because we do see this confusion in our flame resistant is what the garments uh, are called regardless of the technology. Uh, fire retardant is a chemistry that is added to either a fabric or a fiber to make it flame resistant. So, for example, when you have flame resistant uh, cotton, cotton itself in its natural state is not flame resistant. So a fire retardant chemistry has been imparted into those cotton fibers so that they have flame resistant properties. Uh, Motocrylic is a fiber in and of itself does not have FR properties. But when before that fiber is extruded, we add fire retardant chemistry into that soup we extrude that fiber, now you have FR mode acrylic, and then that fiber can be woven into a fabric, and that fabric can become garments. So fire retardant refers to the chemistry. Flame resistant is what the end result is of that partnership between the chemistry, the fiber, or the fabric. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Um, John asks, uh, he, he wants to know if you know where he can find an FR clothing rating chart. FR clothing rating chart. Uh, if, if you could highlight John's uh, question for me when you send that to me, 
Uh, I would like to engage with him direct because I'm not sure what the in, what he's asking there. It just doesn't. I'm not. I'm probably overthinking it, and it may it it may exist. It may not exist depending on what he actually wants. So if we could uh, if we could make that connection, uh, I'd, I'd happily engage with him to see if I could help answer what he's looking for. Sure, uh, we'll, we'll be sure to flag that for you, Derek. Um, the question from Stephen asks, are there examples of combustible dust being generated in blast booths or ventilation system shack out slash clean out areas? Oh yeah, uh, in fact, uh, if you go on to the Chemical Safety Board's website, and I believe it's csb.gov, uh, they have a number of combustible dust events on there. Uh, there was an aluminum dust uh, event where it occurred in the duct system. Uh, as it was being uh, pulled out of the facility, uh, there was some, it was determined that some friction uh, was being caused with, as the aluminum dust particles uh, clashed together in this duct system as it was making a as it came from inside to outside, it had to make a turn to go into the collector. Uh, and I'm probably butchering this explanation, but as it made the turn, that turn, there was friction, and it built up, built up, and eventually it heated up hot enough that it ignited uh, the aluminum dust in the dusting fix in the ducting system. The ducting system then carried that explosion back into the facility. It went down into the actual uh, boiler area, uh, caused a bigger explosion, and actually ended up uh, causing the death of one of the uh, engineering folks in that facility when it exploded. So uh, I can't catalog all the ones that are on CSB, but there is a number uh, on CSB's website that I'll, I'll talk to uh, where these occur. and. There's nothing, unfortunately, that is absolutely uh, bulletproof to these uh, types of events. Okay, uh, here's a question from uh, Ilma. Is the FR clothing good for flammable liquids and vapors exposure in addition to dust? Uh, yes, NFPA 2112 compliant garments, uh, by definition, have to meet uh, combustible dust, gas and or vapors of ignitable liquid. So that, that gives them a broad uh, umbrella coverage of basically anything that is ignitable in that diffuse uh, state. Now, I say that with an asterisk. It is a short-term thermal exposure. If you're doing your hazard analysis and you deem that being in a certain area could potentially expose me to a thermal event that exceeds short term. And short term, uh, I'm going to give you a number here. I'm going to say three seconds or less is short term, three seconds or greater, you are now a fire. Uh, you're going to have to look at additional PPE. You're going to have to look at respiratory protection, hand protection, head protection, uh, ear, back to, you're basically looking at firefighter uh, type protection when you go beyond that three seconds because without respiratory protection, uh, you're looking at something that regardless of the clothing, uh, you couldn't protect against. Okay, um, Karen asks, do the fibers with the added fire retardant have the potential to be absorbed by the skin of the wearer, assuming the fabric is not used until the fibers have been cured? Good question, uh, and I'm going to speak to uh, manufacturing here in the United States and uh, the suppliers here in the United States because that's the only ones that I have experience with. The technologies that they are utilizing that have uh, the fire retardant chemistry to impart those FR properties have been utilized for well over a quarter century now, and the technology is such that it is in embedded uh, in that fiber fabric matrix, and it will not leach out into the skin. Uh, but that's, again, 
working with a proven supply chain because uh, thankfully uh, what Karen is alluding to did not happen in this country. It happened in Australia. It was 3,500 uh, line workers at a utility uh, that were given their new uh, FR arc rated clothing. Uh, within 24 hours, it was reported that close to 10% of the wearers uh, were seeking medical uh, attention for chemical burns and respiratory distress and other uh, irritations, and it was traced back to uh, their body temperature when it raised, and it was uh, it actually leached out. The uh, fire retardant chemistry leached out of the fabric and onto their skin, and that's what was ultimately uh, determined. Uh, that technology that's utilized is not uh, utilized in the uh, the U.S. Uh, with the top providers that uh, you would be looking at here. Okay. Um, Phil asks, for metal dust, is there a concern for dust generated from grinding on carbon steel? Uh, again, I'm going to refer back to the – I am not a dust expert. There are dust experts, and that's why the biggest requirement uh, under 652 is that owner-operator uh, does their dust hazard analysis before they determine anything else. Uh, it depends on the size of the dust that, that's generated. Uh, it depends on a number of factors. You, if, if you go on to OSHA's website and you go into the combustible dust uh, 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 tab on the, on the left-hand side, if you're like me, you'll be surprised when you look at that poster when they show you those 300-plus uh, combustible dust and what, what the processes are and where, where they can originate. It's quite eye-opening. So that's why the first step in uh, 652 is get your dust hazard analysis done. Okay. Um, Beatrice has a question. I think she's referring to an answer you gave to a previous question. Um, she asks, so are the NFPA 2112 garments only good for the three-second exposure? Uh, the, the, the easy answer is, is yes. That's, that's what they are basically tested to is that short-term thermal exposure. Uh, they are not for prolonged exposure to heat, uh, flames, uh, et cetera. This is not, this is not tested uh, to the extent that we test bunker gear, et cetera. This is, you're talking about seven ounces to nine ounces, uh, some a little bit less, some a little bit heavier. Uh, fabric uh, that has the ability to put itself out once that thermal event is over, and that is a short duration thermal event. So the, the quick, easy answer is uh, yes, that's all they are tested to. That's all they are meant to withstand. Okay. Uh, Chris asks, are you aware of any problems with using pest control chemicals such as DEET on FR clothing? Uh, Well-informed question. Uh, if we are out and about and we are in areas where we have mosquitoes and ticks, uh, we're going to use some kind of insect repellent on our clothing. Do not, do not use products that contain DEET. And, it, you know, it's, it's real simple. Uh, look down and usually it will be, if it's an insect repellent, it's going to be the first ingredient that, that's there because that's what's doing all the work. DEET in a dry form and in a wet form is an accelerant. Uh, so you are putting an accelerant on your FR clothing. Do not do that. Uh, what's the recommendation after that is look for uh, permethrin-based uh, products. Uh, Rainbow.org is one to look at. If you do a Google search for non-DEET permethrin-based insect repellent, there's quite a few out there. Uh, make sure the manufacturer can tell you, though, they're safe for FR clothing. Uh, there's a few out there that have taken the added step to have them tested uh, on FR clothing. Uh, BENS, uh, B-E-N-S, uh, theirs is used for uh, 
for gear and theirs is FR safe. Uh, so there's a couple out there that have done the extra step to tell you they're FR safe. Uh, the DEET folks will tell you, hey, don't put it on the clothing, but put it underneath your clothing. So if you're wearing a cotton T-shirt underneath, put it on that. Uh, put it on exposed area. Use wipes are a good way to control it and make sure that it's, you know, if you're putting it on the hands, the back of your neck, your forehead, uh, just don't put it on your FR uh, clothing. Okay. Uh, a question from Gordon. Yes. Can the fire retardant compound, which is added to produce a flame resistant fabric, be removed over a period of time by repeated laundering and therefore render the fabric to be non FR? Good question, Gordon. And uh, the answer again is I'm going to talk to proven. FR uh, fabrics utilized by the top uh, manufacturers here in the U.S., and the answer is no. Uh, laundering, regardless of the technology, whether it's a uh, molecular technology like we have in, in Nomex, whether it's a fiber technology like we have in our FR mold acrylics, or it's a uh, fire retardant chemistry that's applied to, to cotton, the manufacturers here in the United States have such a sophisticated process to date that you cannot launder those FR properties out. As, with the caveat, with the asterisk being, you follow proper, proper laundering care and maintenance. That means do not launder them with bleach. Do not launder them with products that have peroxide in them. Peroxide is sneaky because that's your OxyClean. It's not going to come out flat out and say it's peroxide. It's going to say brighten and whiten your, your colors with oxy. No, no oxy, no color safe bleaches, just simple plain liquid detergents fine, simply plain powder detergents fine. Uh, don't use any fabric softeners on that because fabric softeners tend to be an accelerant. They tend to be petroleum based. They're going to mask your FR uh, performance. If any of those things happen, do not dis discard the garment. Simply rewash the garment uh, without that stuff in it, and you're going to be fine. You can. You have to do these multiple, multiple times over multiple laundrings to impart any kind of concern. So if you accidentally do it one time, not a concern. If you put fabric softener on it, not a concern. Just rewash it without fabric softener, you're going to be fine. Okay, and I think we're probably come to our last question for today. This uh, is from Karen. And she asks, are there any nanotechnology coatings on FR clothing? And if so, is there a concern for those coatings to be released? Wow. Uh, I do know there is some nano research going on right now. Uh, we and others have some joint projects looking into that. I am not aware of any nanotechnology being utilized in FR clothing uh, today uh, in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, I do know that it's probably something that is on the horizon. Uh, I do know for some protective uh, gear like face shields and things like that, we've seen nanotechnology come into place to where those face shields are relatively clear until the arc flash event happens and then they turn dark. So there is some things happening there. Will it make its way to clothing? I do know folks are talking about it, but so we're clear, I am not aware of any nano additives to FR clothing being utilized today in the FR market in the United States and Canada. Okay, thanks so much, Derek. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, my thanks to Derek for his presentation, to Bulwark Protective Apparel for sponsoring today's webinar, and to all of our listeners today. Please be on the lookout for announcements of future Synergist webinars.